Thank you all for tuning in. And um, our presenter today is Graciela de Romera uh, from the Department of Pali Environments and Global Change at the IPCC in Spain. And uh, she's now also based in, uh, in the UK at Abbasus University. Uh, Graciela researches long term environmental change, such as fire regime shifts in drylands and semi arid areas of Africa and the Iberian Peninsula. And um, she peer reviewed her first scientific article after a PhD in 2006 and thinks that she has now crossed about 100 peer reviews. Um, so we have someone with plenty of experience with us today. And if you'd like to ask any questions, please write them down in the little chat box and Graciela will then uh, answer them in the discussion after the presentation. And uh, without further ado, welcome Graciela. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. I will go now into um, full screen. Right, okay. So yeah, thank you Alex for such a nice presentation, introduction, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, what I'm going to tell you today is everything based on my own experience, but that doesn't mean that other experiences are valid or uh, or maybe people in the audience is having different advice. So I'm also very happy to, to listen to you and to read your opinions. Uh, so as Alex said, you can just leave everything in the chat box down there. And yeah, um, well, we chose this uh, title, How to Review a Paper Effectively. And by effectively, I had to look at the definition in the Cambridge Dictionary just to be sure that we weren't necessarily referring to, to how fast we can do this. So actually, it says it's a way that is successful and achieves what you want. And this is what we want, to have a proper, nice review. So if we uh, think of what a peer review is, I think it's actually at the core of scientific quality. Um, we are witnessing now an exponential increase in the number of papers, publications per year, and of course the number of people. So we are a lot of people producing a lot of papers, but this still needs quality control. And I think uh, up to now, peer review is probably the best with of course, it's a human endeavor, so it'll be, uh, there'll be mistakes and things and flaws every so often, but I think this is probably the best method we have so far. And because we have so many papers being produced, we are all really needed. And actually, I think uh, all of us eventually will be reviewers at some stage or will be, will be asked to review a paper at some stage and probably as soon as you have your first paper published will be identified as an expert of a particular matter and you may, you may be asked to review a paper. I think also this is important as a part of our uh, service to the community. Um, in that circle I try to represent what I think it should uh, be entailed in a proper, in a good scientific CV. So we have our own research. Uh, we should have some transference into the public domain, into any kind of, of uh, public that we can address. And of course, some service. And I think uh, probably peer review is at the core of this service. Um, I try to, to represent here uh, how the reviewing process is in a nutshell, so it's not a very detailed uh, workflow of the whole um, reviewing process, but uh, I think it, it has the most important parts. So we submit the paper or the authors submit the paper and then it, it goes to the editor-in-chief that will very quickly make a decision on whether this particular paper is out of a scope for the journal and then it will be accepted or then it will go to an editor, an associated editor, which is already a kind of expert in a particular domain. That person will give it to two or more reviewers sometimes. And as you see, the reviewing process is quite central into the whole workflow. The reviewers will produce an informed report uh, assessing the quality of the manuscript, the quality of the study, following the guidelines that normally journals have in place. And um, reviewers won't make decisions as such, those are up to the editor, uh, but 
obviously, uh, reviewers are giving, are providing the editor with all the tools needed for that decision making process. And after this uh, decision is taken, as you see there, it may go back to us if uh, the uh, decision was accepted with minor or major revisions. So we are going to be asked if we agreed uh, on this to review again the same manuscript with uh, some modifications. So, um, as you see, reviewing is quite critical in the whole in the whole process. And I think it should be taken as if you are trusted with a piece of work that nobody has yet seen before. So uh, that that makes me quite often quite feeling quite special, you know, so, somehow because I'm seeing part of a research uh, that it's only in the uh, hands of editors and authors and co-authors, and somehow we are super powerful now, you know, that we can actually see this paper. And with great superpowers, normally come great responsibility too. So we have to use it well. And then, um, besides being a great service to the community, I think it's also a very good opportunity, especially for early career, but uh, yeah, for all of us, to actually be updated with the scientific literature and with all the new things that um, are being done in a particular domain. So with all this new, with all this literature that we are now being flat with, I think it's, it's a good opportunity to just be updated in particular uh, methods or particular areas of our own expertise. So normally uh, the reviewing process begins with uh, an invitation letter like this. Uh, this is the one, uh, one that I got last week. And I just uh, cover all the confidential information and as far as you see, you are asked if you agree to do your review within 21 days, so three weeks. This is roughly average standard for most journals, so it might be less sometimes, two weeks, sometimes they give you one month. Um, so before we moved into whether you accept this or, or not, I think it's important also to note that with this invitation you will have access to the abstract. So you already have some information apart from the title and the author, the contacting author. Um, you'll have some information on what the paper is about, otherwise you'll be blind to know whether you like it or not. But, um, or whether you are actually an expert on a particular matter. So once we have this invitation, we have to make the decision whether we actually want to take it or we just leave it for someone else. So which are uh, the criteria to make this decision? I think, well, they are pretty obvious, I suppose. Uh, the first one is whether I'm an expert in this particular matter. Sometimes from the abstract, you can't really uh, know whether you are or you are not an expert. But let's take my own expertise. I am, well, I, I don't know whether I'm a full expert, but I, let's say that I know a little bit about paleoecological processes. I've done a, a bit of monitoring current systems to infer past changes. And lately, I'm more focused on how uh, ecosystems respond to disturbance. And in that particular bit, I'm also developing some numerical analysis. So anything very far from any of these three things, um, I, I may have difficulties. For instance, I was telling this morning that I was um, invited last week to review a paper on something like ecophysiology of, uh, of the savanna trees. Well, you know, as much as I like uh, the savannas and I really want to understand them better, I'm not sure I can do a proper uh, report on that because I would need to read so much to actually understand and learn to comment and to produce a reliable report that um, I, I would be probably quite lost and eventually I will devote more time than, than, than average, than needed, to produce a, a good informed um, yeah, second thing would be time. Uh, yeah, this is quite critical because you are asked to produce a report in quite quite quickly, let's say three weeks. And let's normally for me, um, um, a thumb rule that I've used before uh, is like if I produce a paper, then I should review two. Uh, that's something that I keep telling myself, and I don't really do. <laughs> so I review much more than what I publish. But um, but yeah, it's good because I also learn. 
if I feel I'm overcommitted already, I will normally refuse, even if I like the topic. Or and that's that's really hard because you see a particular paper that you'd like to review, but you are already doing so many things. For instance, I won't take a new paper for reviewing if I'm already busy with another one. So um, yeah, um, it's important to to be uh, good with time. You know, we we need to keep timing because we are all in the same kind of. Uh, and they were, and we like our reviews to come early. So time is something to consider. And the last thing, I guess, is whether I have um, conflicts of interest, you know, with people. So is the author or leading author or any of the authors like my best friend, am I ready to reject my best friend paper? Can I produce a balanced report on the kind of research they are doing? So all these questions we have to ask. And then, it doesn't happen to me very often, but is this being led by my worst enemy? Um, again, it might be because you have a conflict with the kind of research that, that person is doing. So it's better just to leave it to someone else. And if you are ready to, to, to proceed, either leaving or staying, so do I have the expertise, do I have the time, and do I have a conflict? Um, I would say if you are ready to leave, Please provide the editor with a few names, as many as you can, uh, because that's really going to be very, very helpful to these particular authors to have a, a review very soon. Um, editors normally have a database in which they are making decisions on who's going to be the reviewer based on a number of criteria, but uh, normally you are very knowledgeable also in your domain, so you may provide a few names that the, review, the editor may not know, so it's always very useful. If you are ready to continue, then I think it's important that we make some comments on the code of conduct that we have to follow when we are making a review, also when we are reading a paper. And for that, I always take in consideration uh, my one of my favorite philosophers. This is Immanuel Kant, a German guy who lived in the 18th century. And yeah, he was clever enough to say, uh, to state a categorical imperative, as he called it, that said, please do not impose on others what you don't wish for yourself. This seems pretty obvious, right? But uh, it's often overlooked. And it happens to all of us, I'm sure, that you start reading a paper and you think, how is it possible that these guys are making such a huge assumption? Or how is it possible that they are producing such a rubbish figure? <laughs> and so on. So, yeah, I think we have to, to bear in mind all, at all times that this is being produced by, by other humans. <laughs> and there will be mistakes and there will be flaws and there will be things that you consider not acceptable. And if so, please bear in mind the positive form of this categorical imperative, which is treat others how you wish to be treated. So let's look for anything good to, to, to be praised. And let's have, a, let's say, a perspective in which you try not to find mistakes, but you try to improve the paper. If it's possible. If it's not possible, then you'll have to reject, but it's important that you at least find something good, something nice that the authors and the editor can, can read. So, in moving into more practical things on how do I do my review. Well, uh, what I normally do, I, I normally work all digital, so I don't print much. I'm pretty paperless these days, and um, I would only print the paper if figures are, for instance, at the end of the paper, not embedded on the, on the paper, because that's going to make easier for me the, the review. Uh, I wouldn't probably uh, print all figures but, um, or tables, but just the ones that I think are really tricky, like some, some figures look like this. This is from a paper that I co-authored several years ago. And uh, yeah, if authors are going to be describing things, I will need I will need probably to look carefully to details, you know, so I may need to print this particular one. But this is how I do. Other people, they just print the paper and then they make notes on the paper and then they just uh, prepare the review based on everything they wrote. Um, the way I work it normally is I have my the 
the manuscript in a PDF a file where I'm normally making uh, annotations that I normally keep anonymous, but of course this is up to you. And um, in these notes, where I write is uh, normally things that are helpful for me to produce my report that I often do in a word processor next to my PDF file. Uh, if you have two screens, it's great. You can have one on each, uh, or we, you can just work in whichever form is useful for you. Um, I normally upload into the editorial platform both files, so the report and also the annotated PDF file, because I think it's also useful for authors to just follow my, my suggestions and recommendations with the sticky notes that appear in the PDF file or comments, or sometimes if I spot a typo or something, I could probably strike it over, and then uh, for authors, I think it's pretty useful, or it'd be useful for me at least. Um, yeah, from there, I just start preparing my, my report. And uh, as I said, I think it's important to have in mind all the time uh, that you, you want to keep a good tone. This is from a real report I did once, but um, I reveal my identity in that particular case, and the author of the paper uh, was happy for me to use it in this particular case. And um, in any case, I'm not saying what the paper was and who was the author. But yeah, what I try to do normally is to follow a particular structure that is what I'm going to detail now. So first thing is I look at the title and the abstract. You won't probably know whether title and abstract are fitting the paper content until you read completely the whole paper. Um, and I normally read like in a linear fashion, you know, like just the whole way through. I, some people is focusing more in different parts, different sections. Some people first look at the figures and then start reading pieces of the paper. But I just go from the beginning to the end. So the first thing we look to the title and abstract is whether they are informative and concise, whether they are going straight to the point. And if they are including, especially in the case of the abstract, a nice overview with the essential facts of our of this particular manuscript. It's also quite useful if they are at the end of the, um, the abstract, if they are actually describing the whole conclusion in a broader context. So how is this important? Why is this important? Um, then if we move to the introduction, I guess uh, we need to be convinced that this is an interesting uh, paper and for that, we, we need a background. And in that back background, we are expecting to have, well, a, a review of the more relevant literature. So this is a good opportunity for us to read some new papers, maybe, or maybe to suggest a new literature that we are aware of and uh, authors aren't. Um, I was thinking this morning that some people, speaking of uh, recommending uh, literature, uh, uh, well, you know, it's always this thing of, I did this and you are not citing it. <laughs> um, I personally, I don't do that much because I, I, I don't probably need self-boosting uh, career or something unless they are just saying, this is the first time we are doing this in, I don't know, Ethiopia, for instance, the place where I'm working now. Um, that's the only case in which I would say, well, listen, I did this before. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, I just try to actually look for other literature, not the one that I'm producing myself. In the introduction, we need to, to look for uh, the, the core section, which is actually the objectives. These need to be a really very clearly uh, delineated state in the in the introduction because this this is going to be like something uh, that we are going to be looking at at all, at all times uh, through the methods and the results because we are using these methods to accomplish accomplish these particular objectives and so on so objectives have to be very clear uh, when we go to methods well uh, we need methods to also be very clear. So in case we need to, uh, I don't know, reproduce sections of it, we are actually able to. So all numerical analytical uh, methods should be very comprehensively presented in a way that anyone could understand. If authors are, um, for some reason, 
violating assumptions or uh, for methods, or they are actually making their own assumptions on other based on other criteria. Those have to be well explained. And if they are making assumptions, these have to be very well met at some stage. So um, it may happen that we are not expert in the methods of a paper, but we are experts on just a particular approach that the paper is making. That's fine. That's all okay. Um, we may want to to let the editor know that that's the case. So we are not experts, and it's totally fine to tell the editor, I'm focusing in this particular section because that's the way uh, that the expertise I have. And something that is becoming quite uh, critical to me, it's whether the methods of a particular paper are reproducible. I know we are paleofox, and sometimes what we do can't be reproduced because I just found that fossil once, or because that archaeological site uh, it's already been excavated, so we cannot just go and take new samples. Or I'm just working with uh, other people's data, I don't know. Um, but I think important parts of your of, of a manuscript of a particular analysis should be reproducible, because otherwise we just, uh, in the future, if we just want to make this again, it won't be possible, and it cannot be used in the future. So we just have to believe that that's right, and I don't think that's very good practice. So this wouldn't be a, a reason for me to reject a paper, but I would encourage uh, authors to make their science as reproducible as possible. Then results sometimes are, uh, I don't know, difficult to follow, a bit boring, maybe a bit dull. But still, they have to be very clear and completely described. So all the things that are in figures have to be described and um, all the things that are being done have to be somehow explained. Of course, some journals don't have uh, results as such. Maybe they have just uh, results and discussion together, or they have particular formats in which you, like in before methods, uh, these are all in supplementary information. That's all fine, but it has to be explained somewhere, or they have to be addressing the right papers, quoting the right papers, where we can find all this information. Then when we move into the discussion, I think the first thing that we have to bear in mind at all times is whether uh, the authors are meeting their objectives, whether they are actually following the, uh, the objectives that they were stating in the introduction. And the other thing that I think is important in discussion, and it happens to, to many of us because we are working paleo, right? So many things we don't know. And even with our evidences, we can't be totally sure because something, uh, speaking of my case, can be produced by human activities, climate change, interaction with other species, and so on. So are we or are authors over-interpreting? And if they do, uh, are they aware of their limitations? Because we may say, well, I'm pretty, I, I want to be sure <laughs> that this is human um, made somehow. And then you refer to your methods saying that I'm aware that these A, B, C, C, and so on things happen. So um, I think it's important that all of that is actually described. Then if the study is applied, is a applied in science, it's applied science or applied to conservation and so on, I think it's important the authors are proposing relevant recommendations based on the results. And then the conclusions, uh, this is normally like a, a relatively short um, section, so we need to look for the conclusions to be clearly delineated, so they are clear and they don't normally refer to references or quoting other papers, and it's not like a reproduction of the discussion, it should be something short. And of course, uh, we need the conclusions to be a straightforward drawn from the interpretations and not new things that uh, authors are just making up. Uh, this is like, generally speaking, what I would look at for every section, but then there are a number of things that I uh, pay attention in particular. Probably given the case that I'm uh, working with archives and proxies, one of the things that is critical to me is uh, H models. 
So all interpretations might be based in the number of H models. If we are working with one single site, then it's one H model. Maybe we are working with a database and we have many of them. So all inference based on an H model should consider errors, for instance, should consider uncertainty, should consider different sedimentation rates. And um, in this particular case, again, from a paper that has been uh, published some years ago by the group I work with in Spain, uh, so they know I'm putting this in here and they are all happy for me to criticize. <laughs> um, we have this um, uh, H model from a lake in the Pyrenees. And um, this model was pretty good and I think still is pretty good because we have uh, roughly 10 meters core with the whole Holocene, so sedimentation rate is quite nice. Um, what we did here was just a linear interpolation, which is not necessarily something bad, but it's more often than not, not reflecting a proper sedimentation rate pattern. And of course, uh, it's difficult for us to infer or to apply the uncertainty of our H model into our proxies. In more recent times, we are more able to produce different H models, and of course, uh, we have new um, uh, dating techniques that are enabling us to have uh, archival uh, sediments that were enabled, we were unable to, to date before, and now we are able to produce new chronologies. So this might be the case of this other lake. Uh, I'm also co-authoring this H model. So again, it's all fine if we just share this here. And this is from a lake in Ethiopia. And we, again, have roughly 50 meters and um, an important number of ages, something like around 48. And we produce here a Bayesian um, model with, uh, with bacon. Many of you are probably aware of bacon. And um, the good thing about, for instance, using bacon is that if you, if you have the time and the patience, you can actually uh, write bits of the code from uh, Martin Blau, <laughs> and that allows you to tweak somehow your needs. So in this case, um, we have uh, a nice uncertainty pattern that we can actually use in our proxies and then we are more able to say whether, for instance, we are having an abrupt change in a particular section and how that affects our proxies. So these are things I pay attention to like first when I'm reading a paper because all inference is going to be based on that. Um, the other thing, as I said, the other thing I look at is whether I would be able to reproduce this given the particular data in a repository or something like that. I think we are, as we are witnessing a massive exponential increase in the number of papers we, papers we have, I think we are also witnessing um, a crisis in reproducibility. And not that we were able to reproduce papers uh, much better before, but I think we have all the technology and all the uh, platforms needed to produce uh, to, to, to be able to, to have reproducible science. So in this special issue in Nature, this year you have different uh, papers addressing this issue. And uh, as I said, I wouldn't reject a paper uh, if people are not giving the data or archiving the data somewhere or whether they are not uh, letting us see the code. But of course, I would encourage this, um, especially for people like me working in Africa where data are so, so scarce, you really need to, to be aware that your data are very, very valuable. So once you have them published, I think it's important to have them somewhere that everybody can see. So yeah, this is a number of repositories. A couple of them actually uh, run by pages like the Global Palifier Working Group and CISAL based on one in charcoal uh, records and the other one in isotopes. But yeah, there's a massive number of repositories where you can find a um, very important number of proxies. So when the time of drafting the review comes, um, yeah, I think uh, if this is the first time that you do a review, it'll be very like a very daunting kind of uh, challenging task. But um, I think it's the sooner you start doing this, the better for you because you get trained and you do uh, faster every time. So uh, speaking of time, I think we we normally will, will need to read the paper 
at least a couple of times. Um, for me, it's normally I normally do my reviews in like in two sittings probably. So the first one would be to um, uh, just have an impression of the paper, making the annotated PDF that I explained before, uh, making a draft review um, relatively uh, quickly, and then I would do that in one day. And then I will leave some hours, <laughs> and then the next day I will read again and I will finish my report. The second time it takes much shorter, and, and yeah, I think uh, reading something with fresh eyes will normally help. To, to produce something nice and that we all like. So when I'm uh, producing my uh, report, again, as I said, um, I try to keep a conversation conversational tone. So I'm not uh, trying to patronize or anything, and just uh, writing it as I would like to as I would like to receive it. So I normally structure my my um, draft in three parts. So first, I just as stating three lines what the paper is about, so authors and editor can actually check up that I read the paper. <laughs> then I moved into uh, normal into general comments, and in here I have like a four wise kind of approach. Um, I first look at whether well at whether it makes sense, you know, whether interpretations are proper properly drawn from results and methods are not having substantial errors and yeah whether the whole thing is actually fine. Then I move into scope and this is not referring to the journal scope because I think that's the editor's task really. Um, what I'm trying to, to do here is to look at whether we can or we as researchers, as uh, reviewers sorry, can actually make the paper able for a wider audience. So sometimes it's just a very uh, particular, very small domain, and there is no way we can do this uh, for a wider audience. And it's not our objective either to change the paper into something new, but um, just providing some hints into into a, how, whether we can actually make it for a wider public. Then uh, speaking of originality, this doesn't necessarily mean that we have to produce a. a you know, like an overpriced paper every time we produce something. But um, I think it's important that we, uh, um, yeah, that whatever we are reviewing is adding up uh, something into our domain. So it's not just uh, something that has been said a thousand times. Uh, it's good if we can actually make uh, an advance, you know, in our, in our, in the science boundary where we are moving. And then I go and look whether it's well written. And uh, with well written, I don't necessarily mean proper grammar and no mistakes. I mean whether this is telling me a story that I can actually follow and is coherent. So um, I suppose when you read so many papers, I just, you can actually perceive with when one is well written. You know, like you actually like it. It's it's almost like a, like reading a story. And I always try just not to only criticize, but to provide with the paper with suggestions. Then I moved into minor comments uh, uh, edits, let's say. And um, yeah, this is not necessarily a copy editing section in which you say all the mistakes you found and like typos and things. Uh, it can be if you want, but uh, it's not your task either. So you can leave that to the editors or the the people in the journal uh, prepare to do that. What I normally do here is just to note whether there are misinterpreted uh, uh, expressions or like in there where I say that uh, that particles uh, charcoal thing it wasn't in the right form or whether I'm missing a particular reference. Then, as I said before, I think, and you say you, you are um, able to see Kant in there. <laughs> I think it's important that we um, that we are at all times thinking that we are addressing people. So it's important that we make our review mindfully, and with that, I mean, yeah, keeping our, the right tone and just being nice, <laughs> being a nice person, and. Just for you to follow a guideline, I think the best 
possible that you can find is by the British Ecological Society. You have the link in there. They produce a really very nice guide on how to uh, review a paper. And these are their main um, yeah, recommendations. And I think for me, one of the most important ones is to recognize when you are given an opinion and when you are just stating a fact. That's important. It's not the same thinking, well, I don't like this, uh, than thinking this is wrong. <laughs> so it's important that you say both, but that you are aware that, that only one of it is actually not an opinion. Um, yeah. Also, with uh, with the review, I have to we have to be very aware that we all have a bias. Um, I think uh, it's often overlooked, but I think we have to be aware of it. It's not nothing that you can actually change, probably, but just by being aware, your report is going to be different. Um, we have uh, all of us probably a gender bias, even if we are. Uh, females who have a gender bias uh, because, well, this has been studied uh, massively and it's not the topic of this uh, talk, so I won't go into it. But, um, yeah, there's a um, massive amount of literature out there for you to look at. Uh, but, yeah, there's some bias in there. There's a geographical bias, uh, so we may uh, look differently to manuscripts produced by people from different uh, cultural backgrounds. Um, also, we have a bias with seniority, so people at different stages of their career may have uh, different kind of struggles with uh, publishing papers. And then one of the wars for me is confir confirmatory or confirmation bias, in which uh, we don't like papers that are contravening what is being said forever, and we all know this, and this thing that you are suggesting cannot be true. So just by being aware that we have these biases, I think we can produce a much better report. I particularly like uh, this blog entry for, by Terry McLean, and why, for instance, we shouldn't say this paper needs to be reviewed by a native English speaker. Well, to begin with, we don't know whether the author is a native English speaker, unless we know the author. But just by the name, say, I'm not a native English speaker, so it's quite easy to spot by my name that I'm not. But what if my family, you know, was raised up in the UK? Sometimes uh, it's just uh, because you ha we have all this bias, uh, we think, well, this is not properly written, and it might be that it's not written the way you would write it. Um, I think there are many ways to say that uh, something has to be fixed, and Terry is making a very nice um, case for that in there. And it's just for you to remember that every time we say um, this should be done by a native English speaker, you are confronting that person with uh, the idea that they are coming from the wrong cultural background. It's not the way you mean it, that is the way it sounds. So, yeah, I think it's important that we stop saying that. Then we moved into the recommendation. You are going to be asked, uh, what's your recommendation for that manuscript? It doesn't mean uh, you are making the decision. You are just helping the editor. You can accept that paper. Normally, uh, just accepting without any revision is kind of odd. It's very strange. Because uh, even small things can be said in here. Then you have the option of just accepting with minor revision if there is no substantial thing to be to be said. And major could be when large parts of, let's say, the discussion or the methods can be reframed or redone in a different manner. Um, I think that's all something that you should make clear in the report, but you only let the editor know about your recommendation. You don't say this to the authors by no means because uh, the authors might, might, may eventually get a misleading idea of what's going to be the actual final recommendation. You can also reject. And as we said, uh, please look for something that is nice of the paper <laughs> to tell the authors. And you reject because there are major things, you know, major flaws in the, how the whole experimental design was done, was 
or how the um, all the inference from the age model is done or uh, uh, even the age model is not good enough for the kind of questions they are uh, posing themselves. If that's the case, uh, do you still think something can be done in the future? You may say so to the editor and the editor may eventually reject with, uh, suggest a rejection with resubmission. So that means a whole resubmission again, but they are willing to accept that. And this is important because uh, the author may want or may not want to just change the things you are saying. So I think this is the right way to do a rejection. Now in the notes for the editor, I think editors, and I've been editor too, uh, editors like <laughs> really that you spend some time making uh, the case for that paper to be published or not in that journal, whether you like it really or not, because sometimes our reports are very, very neutral. <laughs> and uh, for editors, it's difficult to know whether your margin revision is an actual rejection, because you are writing so many things that you don't like. So um, it's important to make uh, some comments, but um, those comments shouldn't be significantly different from the comments you make to the authors. So it's not nice to be very polite to the authors and then then totally condemning the or destroying the paper, ripping out the paper when the authors don't, don't look. So um, yeah, I think the overall message for both should be the same. Uh, but all the statements on the recommendation, as I said before, should be made in here in the notes for the editor. Um, then about disclosing our identity, um, at the beginning of my career, I, I thought, well, you know, if I know the names of the authors, I should put my name too there, you know, so we are all clear here. But with time, uh, I guess you realize that then many of your colleagues in our community, despite seems very big, is not so big, <laughs> then all my colleagues will have a review with my name on it. And as humans as we are expected to be when writing a report, and to be nice and kind. We are also humans to take things very personally and to think that, you know, we hate that reviewer. <laughs> and that really somehow, uh, if you're an early career, that, that may put at risk your future career. It may jeopardize somehow uh, future opportunities. So of course, you are free to do as you want, but that's, uh, that's what I'm doing at the moment. So I'm not disclosing my identity. And if you've seen The Incredibles, uh, this movie, you realize quite early why they shouldn't disclose their identity. Uh, something that I like linked to the identity is, if possible, to, to make reviews for double blind, because then in there we are all equal. We don't know who the authors are, and they don't know who are we as reviewers. Or then going to open peer review as Climate of the Past. Uh, journal where you can still be uh, anonymous if you want, but uh, what I like of it is that we can see what everybody is saying there. Uh, if you don't know climate of the past, um, it works in a way in which a paper is submitted and then it's put into a dis discussions form in which anybody can actually comment on it. So you, you can see how the um, yeah, the discussion is being developed and eventually there will be maybe a couple of main reviewers that still may want to be anonymous and the editor will make a decision on it. So I, I really like this kind of journals. And yeah, I'm coming to an end for my presentation. What happens after the decision? Well, if you uh, look at, the, at this infography that I put at the beginning, um, if we are accepting with minor or major revisions, we are going to be addressed later on to just review whether the authors were following our suggestions and comments and editors' um, uh, comments. And this second time is going to be very easy to review because we are going to focus on critical aspects, so that, that should be much faster. If you want to read more on how to produce a nice uh, uh, review, these are some resources. I insist that I really like the British Ecological Society Guide. It's really a very nice approach to how to produce a nice uh, review. And, and yeah, um, something that I was aware of very recently is that you can actually have a track of all your reviews uh, using this tool, Publins. And um, yeah, I think, uh, of course, conf confidentiality is always kept, so they, don't will, they won't publish the, the reviews that you've done. 
but they keep a track of the number of reviews you do. So yeah, it might worth uh, a look, you know, just for your early career, maybe starting, you want to have a look to it. So just to end, I want to thank you, uh, Pages Early Career Network. I think you are a very nice bunch of people, guys, <laughs> as most of the Pages community. And I think I've learned a lot on how to do a proper review just by uh, listening to my senior and to all the very nice paleo, uh, paleo folks. And just to, to finish, if I've learned anything from anyone that's been from my group here, uh, because, uh, yeah, I think uh, everything about how to be sympathetic with others is something that we really practice in, in our group. So yeah, thank you all for listening, and I'll be more than happy to answer questions and to listen to your advice also. So yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Graziella. Um, and that was very insightful, and I absolutely enjoyed it. So are there any are there any questions? I think um, I see that Nicola are typing at the moment. I mean, if people want to turn on their microphone and ask the question directly instead of typing, you can do that. I'm making everybody a presenter at the moment, which would allow you to turn on your microphone. I, I guess I was, I, I don't know, probably I was too fast, I don't know. <laughs> No, I just realized that when you were in full screen, people couldn't write, couldn't have access to the chat, or they couldn't write the questions while you were talking. Mm -hmm. yes. To what extent, Nicholas is asking, to what extent should we be correcting grammar and language, especially if there are lots of issues? Look, if you are seeing the issues uh, and you check them, well, just let the editors know, you know. Um, so it's fine, you put it in your minor report. But, uh, but uh, I wouldn't, what I'm trying to say is that I wouldn't focus on that necessarily. So if you spot them, then yeah, write them down. But it's not your task. Not sure that's answering the question? Okay, yeah. It, it was all clear. <laughs> Now, I mean, I have a question, I mean, it's not like a okay. advice really, but it's not like how long does it take you in total, you know, how many hours do you spend doing to review one paper on average, you have that two steps process, mm -hmm. I'm guessing, you know, a couple of hours in each step or something like that? It's more around three hours in each step, or let's say three hours first step and a couple of hours next step. Okay. So it's uh, five hours if I'm expert enough, say it's something about fire, for instance, that I'm becoming more knowledgeable on that, or uh, um, I don't know, East Africa, now I've read a lot about, I, I'm reading a lot about that, then I, it may take me long, uh, shorter than, than if it's about, I don't know, long sequences in the Iberian Peninsula, because, you know, that kind of literature I don't really have around, so I have to, to refresh and that's going to take me longer. And Nicolas is writing a, another question. Yeah. <laughs> She's the only brave. Good for <laughs> you, Nick. <laughs> In a small field of research, what could you consider a conflict of interest? Friends, colleagues? Um, well, I, that's a difficult question because I think it's a question you have to pose yourself. Do you think you can produce an assessment without being influenced by, we previously worked on this uh, together or you are my best friend? If you think you won't be able to criticize your best friend in a you know in a nice manner but to criticize or even to reject your best friend's paper then don't do it then don't take it because 
you know, you have to be able to reject your best friend's paper. <laughs> okay. And then there's another one that says, uh, at EGU, there was an editor that mentioned that she sometimes chooses people outside the expertise of the article on purpose. Have you ever experienced this? Um, well, let's say that there are several several levels of expertise, no? We have like a very focused expertise uh, and then a bit wider. I'm not sure uh, how far out of the expertise this person was choosing people. But um, let's say I'm a biologist by training. I wouldn't probably enjoy uh, reviewing a paper on microbiology. <laughs> I don't know. I can do some uh, ecological uh, reviewing. Say, for instance, I've reviewed recently a paper on um, fire ecology, modern fire ecology. Well, that, that's something I can do. It's not exactly my expertise, but uh, it's closely related. So I think that's helpful. And of course, for editors, it's very good to have diversity. Different people from different domains, from uh, different stages on their career, and so on. So yeah, diversity-wise, I think it's good. And if I may add on that, uh, you don't necessarily have to be an expert on all of the paper that you have to review. Because recently, I've received a paper to review, and it had two very different parts in it. And for the first part, I was completely able to give a real expertise on it. But for the second part, it was largely outside of my area. So, but that's, mm. that's not a problem at all. You just need to be able to, I think, just write it in your review. I can give a full expertise on that part, but on that one, uh, I'm not really qualified. And that's, I think that's completely fine because sometimes for the editors, it's really hard to find people that are able to uh, review the whole paper, but uh, if you're asked to review something like that, you shouldn't be afraid just to say that part I'm really comfortable reviewing and that part not so much. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, Manu, yes. Um, if I follow up on what you just said, I think it's really very useful for editors to, um, to, to editors and to authors too, to let them know that look, this is my expertise and this is what I'm going to be commenting on and that's it. So uh, that's also, you know, creating the space for saying, okay, this person is a real expert on this particular part. So yeah, I think that's good. That sounds like a very long question. <laughs> <laughs> you should prepare yourself. It's going to be a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Will most editors know if we are an experience in creative reviews? Is it worth let, letting the editor know if we are an experienced reviewers? Well, um, they, they won't necessarily know if you are an experience because what they have is a database with names and these databases are created by by um, by the, com the editorial companies, um, and then they may have like say you are a nice auto person, no, and then you you've produced the last three years three papers which are actually your PhD. You automatically become an expert on that, but that person won't necessarily know uh, whether you are a PhD student or just whatever they have other indicators based on metrics but i they don't always follow say for instance they will have age index and then that it's not a metric that i like but it may point to how long you've been in the business um i think it's good if you let the author the, sorry the editor know that you are uh, an experience in creating reviews 
uh, the editor will be, I'm sure, equally happy, you know, because editors like uh, complete long reviews where they have enough um, pieces, like, let's say, to build up a final decision. So, yeah, good, good question. I think it's good if you let the editor know. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure. Oh. Uh, there are more questions or? Okay, there is some someone else. Don't be afraid, guys. I'm sure you have plenty of questions. <laughs> they are not there, actually, you know. <laughs> she knows everything. Just ask her. No, 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 no. <laughs> Okay, once I had, a, I had review in form of scanned images with handwriting notes and that's fine. However, reviewer used very specific systems of signs to denote some of the mistakes and that was a bit hard to decipher. Maybe English copywriting system? What is your stance on that? I think that's, that it's a bit misleading. Yeah, I totally agree with you, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds to me quite hard for the author to actually, uh, you know, follow on that. Mm, I think in the case you are um, rising here, I think the editor should have somehow uh, helped more, you know, on that. I know reviewing is, is quite a task because you have to, to produce um, a report. And for all, I don't know, even people nowadays, but from all the school people, uh, it's all about writing paper in paper, you know, physical paper with a pen, and then um, it's just difficult for them to eventually produce a report and everything. Well, if that's the case, either don't take the, the review, or if you do and you end up with that, uh, the editor should have somehow asked to another reviewer and then give you all that information, but, um, but also a new report. So, and then always letting you know what's going on. So why things are taking longer, you know? So yeah, I don't have any experience on what you are just saying. I've never seen this before, but um, it, seems, it sounds odd to me. I mean, one thing is important in the whole process that you can communicate with the editor as well, because usually, I mean, it took me a while to realize that, but uh, usually the editor is just the, the person you send the paper to and you get the good or the bad feedbacks every three months. But it's really someone you, you can and you should communicate with to, if you have any problem with the review, for instance, you know, getting like a very bad, uh, bad in the sense like uh, the very hard to decipher review. You should really try to communicate with your editor and most of the time I'm sure they will try to help you figure it out and they will, or they could tell you, yeah, maybe just ignore it for the moment because this is really uh, unclear. I'll try to get another review or something like that. I think it's really important to uh, create that connection with the editor and, and not be afraid to, to talk, discuss, and uh, even tell him when some things, you think some things are wrong. Yeah, editors, as, as all of us, they're also human. <laughs> they're normal people, you know, with normal lives. So it's good if we can actually communicate with them. Yeah, Nicholas was asking here, is there a way to volunteer or increase the likelihood of you being asked to be a reviewer, apart from publishing loads of papers? Well, yeah, um, I, the first thing that comes to my mind is go to 
climate of the past kind of journal. And in there, you, every time a paper is submitted to uh, discussions, it's open. Anyone can actually create um, a report in there and comment on that. And I think it sounds uh, kind of a lot of work if you are all the time in there. Like every every time there is a new <laughs> discussion paper, you will go there. But um, what I do is I just have like, a, um, yeah, let's say like an alarm noticing all the time there is a paper published there into something or submit it there into something that is closely related to my expertise. Um, the other thing, um, I'm not sure, but there used to be a time in which you could actually volunteer, like writing the, the, the journals, you know, <laughs> like, hello, I'm here, I volunteer to do uh, reviewing. And these days we are so, we are publishing so much that we are really very short of uh, reviewers because we have a lot of authors compared to the number of papers, actually. And something that I didn't say before uh, is that my rule of thumb normally is for every paper that I publish, um, I review two. Uh, but I'm not actually following that rule, really, because, <laughs> because I think, of course, I review much more, much more than what I've published. So um, it should be a rule. But um, I'm just following these days, that rule. At the beginning, I reviewed a lot, and that's a very good way for me to learn. So I encourage, I encourage as Estela uh, was typing in there, to, to go into a climate of the past kind of journals. There are several like that. It's not the only one. So I don't know whether that also answers your question. Yeah, oh yes, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever missed a deadline for a review? How do you cope with that? Yeah, badly, you know. <laughs> do you cope with that with a lot of guilt? <laughs> um, if I see, I, it's it's happened to me, so I, I won't lie, you know. <laughs> um, uh, when you realize you are not meeting your deadline, please do write the editor. So... Tell the editor, look, I'm not meeting my deadline. If you think uh, this is very urgent, then please send to someone else. But if you can wait for a, and then bracket, reasonable time of uh, amount of time. So if you are asking for another month, then maybe you should say, sorry, can't, and then put it to someone else. Uh, but if it's just a matter of one week, for instance, uh, most editors will give you the one week. And that's fine. And then uh, the editor will be able to tell the reviewers, uh, sorry, the authors, look, your review is going to be delayed because one of the reviewers is asking for an extension. So, again, we are all humans here and we sometimes can't meet deadlines. So I think that's totally fine. And as Manu was saying, just communicate with your editor. Yeah, shall be. Loads of questions, that's great. Always good. <laughs> I'm gonna turn everybody as a presenter on the side. So if you wanna turn on your microphone, you can also ask your question instead of typing it. But not, not all at the same <laughs> time. <laughs> all at the same time, obviously. And you know, considering how fast I am, Yeah, I see Betty. This Bedouin McConnell is a very dear PhD student that I, Ethiopian PhD student that I like. So thank you, Betty. I don't know whether you can hear. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, in the meantime, I I have a question that popped in my mind um, earlier today. And um, can you actually request? I mean, you were talking about you know double like blind peer review, um, but can you actually? request from the editor that uh, that you would like to review a paper uh, double blind or as in as in, a, as in the reviewer instead of the author have you come across anything like that um, well the trouble is that if the journal um, it doesn't have uh, that system in operation 
when you are invited, you already know. Oh yeah, because you get an email and it says who it was. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's already too late. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, because that would at least help. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Okay. There are some questions being typed in here. Uh, let me go to them. I'm a third year PhD student and I'm writing my first paper for an AGU journal. My first question is that my paper is extending a data set from 2014. And and she keeps writing. <laughs> I don't know how appropriate it is to mention that paper in my results sections. You mean your paper is not being published yet, I guess. So it's in preparation, not yet. Yeah, okay. Um, it depends on the journal policy, you know. Uh, if if most of your uh, new paper is based on something that is not published yet, you may um, you may want to add it temporarily in the um, supplementary information, and then once it's published, maybe in the due time, you know, while while your paper is new paper, while your new paper is being reviewed, the other one is going to be published, and then you'll be able to say at least in press or something. But um, it's not good to have uh, too much of this because then the reviewer is left blind, you know, with uh, information. Say, in that H model that I presented, the second one, um, I'm writing a paper based on that H model, which is still not, which is still not published. I'm very lucky that um, this, the leading author, is my co-author in this second paper, so he agreed to present the H model in an, in, in this new paper in the supplementary information. So that will be my recommendation. Uh, there were more questions. Um, Keep the question from Leanne what if you, before. What if, you review a paper, what if you review a paper, rejected it, and received an invitation to review in a different journal? Should you? Is there a common practice with this? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, some some journals, if they, are, if they belong to the same editorial uh, company, they will know whether you already rejected it. If if you are aware that these two journals, separate journals, belong to the same editorial company, I think you should tell the editor. Just tell, look, I rejected it already, and uh, unless you see that they've made uh, consistent changes according to what you said, uh, then you wouldn't review it again. But um, I think it's worth looking just to see whether they actually did what you were suggesting. Um, Fernanda Charqueño is asking, which should be a good consideration when you write a paper review? I, I'm not sure I understand the question, Fernanda, um, because uh, I guess everything I said is kind of a good consideration, no? I think that's <laughs> what she meant. Yeah, thank you for the tips, which should be good. Ah, ah okay, okay, thank you, okay, fine. Um, yeah, I think those were the questions so far, no? Mm. How early in our career should we start reviewing a paper? Well, as soon as you can, as soon as you are offered. Um, do we start try reviewing papers when we are hopefully in a postdoc? No, actually, I think as, you, as soon as you write a paper and it's published, uh, believe it or not, you are already a bit of an expert. You've probably read a lot to produce that, that paper, a more lot than many of as <laughs> senior researchers, let's say, because we don't have the time, probably. <laughs> we are focused into too many things that we don't have the time to be focused in a single matter. I can see that also when I work with PhD students, you know, that uh, they are lucky enough to be focused in a single thing. Um, so, yeah, I think if you've been spotted and invited uh, to review a paper and you think you are comfortable with your expertise in that paper, I think you should do it, and it's a great way also to learn on how to produce a good paper yourself. Um, yeah, Alex is typing and pasting in their uh, Climate of the Past website. In there, you can start um, producing a review without being invited. So you can just go there, spot a paper that you like, <laughs> and then start commenting, and also read all the people's uh, reviews so you can learn how to do it. Um, hello, very happy joining the review section. My question is, during the time of developing a manuscript, the presenter made mention of reasonable literature summary. 
how can one know when he, she have really covered all existing literature within the scope of this topic? Well, I guess you can't be sure, you know, <laughs> that everything is being covered. It depends on the domain, how new maybe this particular discipline is, and then whether you are um, expert enough in a particular discipline to just say this particular paper is missing, or I think you should have looked at this other thing. I think it's just difficult, but um, but yeah, if you read the introduction and you feel that a fairly amount of information is being properly referred, I think then it's good. If you feel like adventurous, then you may go and look for every single reference. Then that's going to take very long for you, but maybe you are in the position to just learn and read, and I assure you that the editor is going to love that, you know? <laughs> Um, sorry, I'm just moving into the next question. Um, is it appropriate to refuse an invitation to review a paper due to conflict of interest? Uh, for instance, too close to the author, conflict of large-scale interpretation, how to suggest another reviewer? Um, yeah, sorry, um, we'll go, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, of course, it's totally fine to refuse an invitation if there is a conflict of interest. I think you should make uh, this point clear to the editor. Um, I, when I said it's my best friend, it's my worst enemy. Um, if, if it's someone you are normally working with, but um, you are not sharing a massive amount of papers, let's say you are not in the 50% papers being, or 60% papers being published with that person, um, maybe you can go and do a fair uh, review. I think it's up to you to actually ask yourself whether you can be fair and balanced. And of course, you just tell to the editor why you are refusing. And yes, please suggest other reviewers. Yeah. Uh, when you are offered an invitation and you decline, the, um, the editorial platform will ask you, please do provide us with other names. And also, not only the names, but which, which one is the expertise of these people. So yeah, please do that. Um, do we suggest reviewers to the journals we submit to? Um, well, you can, yeah, I think you, you should do that. That may help the um, editor. The editor, as I said, will have um, uh, like an editorial management tool in which they access a database. And that database has a number of criteria that will help the editor to identify people. If the people that person is identifying somehow collides or concurs with your own suggestions, that's great. They will go straight into that uh, um, um, suggestion, you know, that suggestion that you are making. So yeah, that's always good. Yeah, more than welcome. Definitely. I'm also learning a lot doing this. <laughs> Um, in your opinion, as an experienced researcher, what do you think about prevalence for young researchers, such as number of reviews performed and impact factors of the journal? Uh, well, I don't know whether it totally massively depends on the institutions assessing our CVs. Here in Spain, uh, things are getting extremely competitive, <laughs> and well, anything that is uh, telling the um, um, the committee assessing your CV, that you are an experienced person, that you've done a lot, that's good. Having your profile in problems is not going to damage your image. Uh, it's just time consuming because every time you do a review, you have to enter and say, I did this review, and they will double check with the journals. Uh, so it might be good if you have the time and you want to update your profile. Um, so yeah, I would probably do. Uh, when I was at the beginning of my career, problems didn't exist. So um, I didn't know that this was could be useful. Some journals have templates on how to complete reviews. Can you share your point of view? Would that suffice? Or should reviews provide general detail notes too? By the way, thanks for your talk. Yeah, thank you, Worry. Um, well, yeah, I think. <laughs> the 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 more thorough, the more comprehensive your report, the better. 
because sometimes the editor will end up having uh, a big number of, uh, well, I don't know, question marks. I don't know what to do. Maybe one is saying reject and the other one is saying accept. I need more than just this guideline, which is very basic, right? I mean, they normally ask whether figures are appropriate, whether you think the, uh, the interpretations are within the scope of the journal and so on. I think, I think you really need to have a bit of more uh, comprehensive report. I see the screen on my presentation moving around. <laughs> That's funny. I do funny, think no? that. <laughs> it's like every single person in my group is being scrutinized. Exactly. We're just looking at everybody's face. <laughs> Wait, I'm just going to downgrade everyone. <laughs> and we'll see who's the... In cases two reviewers have different point of view, do the editor cross compare? Do you mean cross compare uh, with others, or um, they will may send to that uh, they may send to other reviewers, or uh, uh, I heard that they send one reviewer to another, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. It never happened to me. Uh, never happened to me. No, I think you actually sometimes you. Um, you kept the impression that the editor wasn't following your advice, really, because uh, you say, I would accept this paper, and then eventually it's rejected. And you say, why? <laughs> well, because you don't have the full picture. You don't know what the other reviewer is saying. Maybe you are an um, expert in a particular area, but the other one is full of mistakes. Or, um, I'm not saying the editor is always right, okay? I'm not, <laughs> the editor is also human, <laughs> so it can make mistakes. So. Um, but yeah, it's just for us to be aware that we are just recommending. That doesn't mean uh, they are going to totally follow what we say. So the more notes you can make to the editor on what, what your general impression was, uh, the better. Thank you, Ari. <laughs> Ari is another person I know well. <laughs> no. Connecting from Chile, probably. Ooh. <laughs> so connected. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you all, you know, it's been really nice. Very active group. <laughs> so do we have any more final questions? Uh, maybe if there's one more question, uh, do a show of hands, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. Otherwise, we're spot on on time again. <laughs> well done, Graciela. <laughs> so a couple of people seems to be writing, maybe, I don't know, keeps popping up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think good thank you has to go to Pages uh, Early Career Network, actually. <laughs> I I know personally many of these guys, so and they are great. <laughs> so I think I think you should engage more and and share. You are not alone there, you know. I think it's important to have all these people as a network somehow supporting you. And yeah, I think that the great thank you has to go mm -hmm. to them. Speaking of engagement, but I see people are starting to leave. Uh, we have that <laughs> poll uh, that we would like uh, people to take. It takes like five to ten minutes, I guess, and it's about the future webinars that we will organize. Uh, we want to hear from you what you would like us to organize. Uh, we don't want to impose any topic because we really want to, uh, to produce uh, products that you guys feel like are really needed. So uh, there's a few questions in there, and it won't take you long to, to respond yeah. to it, and it will really help you, uh, help us, sorry, to, uh, to organize the future webinars. So, so please take, take five minutes and have a look at it. That would really mm -hmm. I think more questions are coming, and I'm, I'm happy to answer if, if we allow uh, some oh, more yeah, time. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. So, yeah. 
to the um, Betty is asking, what is your advice for PhD students who are writing thesis and submitting to reviewers? Uh, what do you mean by advice, Betty? Well, I have many advices, you know. <laughs> I just keep calm. There's life after the PhD, I promise you. <laughs> so I know it, it all seems terrible when you are producing papers. Um, well, I think something that no one told me, and it's important that we all learn, is that nothing happens when you fail at the beginning. <laughs> so if your papers are rejected, there's nothing wrong with you. Um, we are all learning, and that's important. I know we are all pressed by time, but um, but yeah, it's important to have a clear goal that is just producing good science and and then eventually having a PhD. But uh, it's nothing wrong with us. Okay, so don't take things personally. Next one is saying I'm not very much clear on the methods of a manuscript. I'm referring from the presenters, numerical and analytical, comprehensively presented. Yeah. Um, I think, well, I think this is actually, Manu, I think next webinar should be how to write a paper. <laughs> <laughs> there seems to be um, a lot of questions about that, yeah. Yeah. Mm, well, uh, if I understand the question right, I think um, if you want to know how to write your methods, that's a different thing, and I'm not sure we have the time now for that. But uh, something important in the methods is that everything you did is clear. But at the same time, not into the detail, like I opened the, the, the bottle of, I don't know, chlorhydric acid and then I put some in a probe or something, not, not to that detail. But um, especially if there are some protocols that are standard in your domain, then you don't need to go into there, you know. But if you are approaching, say, a quantitative method that has never been used for that thing you are doing now, uh, I think you need to explain carefully so anyone could do. That's what I meant with comprehensively presented. So anyone could actually reproduce what you are doing. MacBit is, again, someone I know. He's a PhD student I could supervise. So <laughs> how do we check the discussion is well written in reviewing? Or points we need to check in reviewing the discussion part? Uh, well, I think something important in the discussion, as I said, is that uh, we bear in mind the objectives. So. The discussion is where you actually make interpretations out of your results. So you are not just making the interpretations for the sake of nothing. You have to just address your objectives. And we need to be sure that that's in there. And also that there is a coherency in the storytelling. So uh, we are not ju just jumping from one result to the other. So there should be some structure. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you all. Do, uh, yeah, maybe an, another question is coming. Um, yeah, I agree with Adriana. <laughs> Okay. So, yeah, yeah, the talk way will be public. Will be all as Manu said. This is this is all being recorded, and it will be in um in the YouTube channel of uh, Pages ECN, and I will have it also public in my website and the, my Twitter. So yeah. Yeah, we will make everything uh, available. You know, uh, if you want to stay updated concerning our activities, you should follow us on Twitter and or Facebook. Uh, because in the next few months, I think we'll have like a, another two webinars. So they, they, there's a lot that's coming, and they, I think it's if you're interested, it's really good value for you to to follow us on the on the social media. And we will always make everything, all the products available, videos, uh, all the slides of the presenters, other things I can't think of at the moment, but everything. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Um, and yeah, make sure to follow us on all the social media accounts, and uh, we'll keep you updated through them and through the mailing list. 
And I guess. Um... Uh, Harvey, do you have the Facebook link to copy right now, quickly, just in case? <clears throat> but yeah, thank you, Graciela, for doing this not once but twice within a day. So that probably wasn't that easy. But uh, I think it was really valuable, and the fact that people stayed that long asking, asking questions I means there is a real, uh, there was a real need for that. So that's that's really good. And thank you very much for taking the time. We all know everybody is busy, but you took a lot of time to to organize that. So thank you very much for that. Well, thank you, guys. This was I actually enjoyed both times. You know, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know but uh, <laughs> but I actually enjoyed uh, giving a choice yeah I didn't mind and I had different questions in the different slots so it was all good and as I said I really like this community so yeah thank you Chavi <laughs> that was really nice to have you around and um, yeah I really like pages community and you in particular guys I wish I could have had you know about a community like this when I was beginning so yeah thank you all right so i guess this is it thank you again everyone for for joining today and i hope to see you soon for the our next adventures <laughs> <laughs> uh,